if you know my ministry here for the last 10 years, I hope you've heard me say that you know the, the Psalms were Jesus' prayer book, and if they're Jesus' prayer book and hymnal, they ought to be our prayer book and hymnal as well. And so whenever you pick a song, that's based, many times it's based on a psalm, right? Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So, uh, the Psalter ought to be a precious and beloved book, if for no other reason than, it, than this, it promises Christ's death and resurrection so clearly and pictures his kingdom and the condition and nature of all Christendom that it might well be called a little Bible, a handbook. Um, So the Psalter, or the Psalms, is the book of all the saints and everyone, in whatever situation they may find, finds in that situation Psalms and words that fit their case, that suit them as if they were put there just for their sake. Do you ever feel that when you read God's Word? That Word is just for you. So that they could put it, not put it better themselves, or find a wish for anything better. That's what happens when we read Scripture. This is kind of a funny quote, so I, I had to include it because of who I am. Okay. <laughs> so Luther in the Old Testament, uh, a book written by Henrik Bornkamp, um, as Luther liked to say, the communicative power of all the Old Testament stories and images rested on the fact that they were painted so powerfully, thus he himself poetically described the poetic greatness of the Old Testament, the prose as well as the poetry, a long time before... <laughs> Herder. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you. Oh, that's, that's really good. <laughs> so, do you know who he's talking about here? Yeah. Have you heard of Johann Gottfried Herder? He was a German Old Test. I mean, Old Testament scholar. scholar. He was a poet. He was a pastor. He was a philosopher. Uh, he lived in the 1700s. He died in 1803. And I like to think that he's my great, 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 great yeah, grandfather. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I hope that he is. Uh, I have his book called the, On the Spirit of Hebrew Poetry. So I think we are related. <laughs> Romans gave Luther his theology, but it was the Psalms that gave him his thunder. <laughs> That's a good quote. Yeah. Come, let us sing a psalm and drive away the devil. So he loved the Psalms. He also, what did he especially love in the New Testament? He loved Paul's, Paul's writings, uh, Paul's letters. God forbid that there should be one jot or tittle from all of Paul, which the entire church universal should not follow and keep. Um, this is, I come to do some quotes now and later from this little book called Luther the Preacher by Frederick Moyes, Fred Moiser. Um, his preference for Romans is well known, but not nearly so well known as the fact that of all the sermons he preached, probably over 4,000, and of the 2,300 that have been preserved, only about 30 were on Romans. Hmm. Ten of those are from chapter 12. He has more than 1,000 sermons on the Synoptic Gospels, Synoptic means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, do you know what S-Y-N means? S-Y-N means with, mm -hmm. and what's optic mean? To, to see. see. <laughs> to see with. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke see with one another. And John is another, another way of describing mm -hmm. Jesus' life and ministry. So when you hear about the word synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they're pretty parallel and based on each other. But anyway, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing about, he loved Romans so much, but he never, he didn't preach on it very much. You know what the weird thing is for me, too? I don't know about you, Pastor Jack, but um, I hardly ever have preached on Romans either. Uh, I've, and I've never taught on Romans. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenging, deep, mm -hmm. deep book. Um, in fact, I would rather teach Revelation than Romans. Oh, wow. 
So, but um, someday I might do that here. We'll see. Um, in Luther's preface to the New Testament, John's Gospel and his first epistle, that's 1 John, and St. Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, and St. Peter's epistle, these are the books which show you to Christ and teach you everything that's necessary and blessed for you to know, even if you never to see or hear any other book of doctrine. And then he says St. James' epistle is a perfect, strong epistle <laughs> compared with them. For it has nothing of an evangelic kind. So, uh, Martin Luther said that the book of James in the New Testament is like a pistol of straw. He didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> because, because in that book, well, does anybody know the explanation? Talks about work, more works. More. Yeah, talks more about our faith and works, right? That faith without works is dead. Um, the point is, we know the point is that faith follows works. Um, you can't just have faith if, if you don't if you don't have if works don't follow. You know, so it's like a shadow, right? When the sun's out, you're going to have a shadow. That you got the two have to go together. But but Luther was so strong on faith alone that when he saw when he was reading James that he said this, yeah, he didn't like it. He he had some kind things to say about it in other places too, but. It was one of his least favorite books. Now, this, this commentary is about uh, Revelation. How many of you like the book of Revelation and the, the last book of the Bible? Anybody? Confusing, confusing. I like it too. <laughs> now, I completely disagree with Martin Luther <laughs> <laughs> on this point. Martin Luther said, about this book of Revelation, I leave everyone free to hold his own opinions. I would not have anyone bound to my opinion or judgment. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> what I say, what I feel. I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. My spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. For me, this is enough reason to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. I completely disagree. But to teach Christ, this is the thing which an apostle is bound above all else to do. So, you know, I just, I don't think he, I don't think he understood apocalyptic literature and what it meant for the time. What, Daniel is apocalyptic literature. Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's written during time of persecution. Okay? And so Luther didn't understand it. He was being persecuted. He should have understood it, but, but he didn't. I think the book of Revelation is about Jesus. The revelation of Jesus Christ is how it begins. And it is all about Jesus and his victory over evil. Um, and John, who writes from, receives the revelation from Patmos, he, when he writes to the seven churches, you know, he is their pastor. Pastors love their people. Pastors don't want to scare their people. Pastors want to give their people hope. Uh, and that's what I believe for John and Revelation, too. But John was his favorite gospel. That's right. That's right. That's true. I'm on in, Margaret. Um, so Luther made attempts to remove those, some of those books, but then they finally, they're at the, the very end of the New, New Testament. And even in the German Bibles today, those books are at the back of the New Testament. Okay. Took these pictures. Well, no, I didn't take these pictures, but um, this is exactly what it looks like in one shelf, one long shelf up in our library. Luther's works, 55 volumes. You can see that volumes 1 through 30 are all different parts of the Bible. Um, there's quite a bit of the Old Testament, right? Um, some in the Gospel of John, Romans, Galatians. Some of the letters of the end of the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament. Um, but the first 30 volumes of the 55 are on the biblical books. Now the next slide I thought was kind of interesting um, is that there are more volumes of Luther's works being published, coming out. So here's the schedule. Uh, 
And I did not know that, that there is wow. more volumes being published of Luther's works. Uh, you mean that have not been previously published? Right. Yeah. Of more of more of his writings. Wow. So twenty twenty four, we have to wait for the Luther's <laughs> That's a long time. But you consider it we've waited five hundred years, right? <laughs> uh, this the picture on the right is a, I actually have all 55 volumes of Luther's works on one CD. Oh, so that's wow. it's kind of a handy thing to look up. If you want to look up a word or phrase, a Bible reference, wow. look it up and you can find it on all 55 volumes. It's kind of like what uh, lawyers have nowadays when, you know, they don't the have to have the big libraries. They just mm -hmm. have a couple CDs or DVDs or whatever. Um, so now that the choir has... has Come in. <laughs> Some of the choir we're, ready to make um, we're going back to uh, we're going to go back to sing here because I put a song on. We have to work. So uh, we're our first topic was Luther as translator, and so this. Uh, Some of you remember this man, Herbert Brooker? Oh yeah. Yeah, what a guy. Yeah. I had lunch with him one time at Worker College and he explained the world to me using a milk carton. Oh. <laughs> so, so, wow. He was so creative. But we, we knew him at Holden Village. Holden Village, too. Oh. That just reminded me, I, we did several sessions at Holden with, with Herb. And one morning, we were, as we were walking over to the meeting place with all the people, it were logs, bits of logs that the guys had chopped for the winter. Mm. And as we went in, he reached over and picked up a log and there were two a pair of boots, and he picked up one of the boots and walked in. And that was his text oh. Oh. on the spot right <laughs> wow. there. Wow. wow. So creative. But he uh, wrote a lot of different uh, songs based on different parts of Luther's life, and a lot of uh, drama, little mini dramas, too, that are in this book. So let's sing together. The tune is uh, my, um, Church's One Foundation, and this is about Luther being a translator. So it tells the story, especially the story of Luther translating the Psalms. So thank you choir members for helping us sing. <laughs> In silent Warburg Castle the translating began. God's word turned into German, the Psalms a diadem. He read with jubilation the joy of David's songs, and healing and salvation unfolded in the songs. <coughs> oh, songs so filled with beauty of myriad pictures bright, he saw their text and color, the songs gave Martin sight. He saw the church reflected, he found himself inside. While God and all creation, through psalms now open wide. The psalms once only Latin, for learned souls to pray, were now for all the people to pray and Songs for prayer and singing now had a German look, and through the hand of Martin became a prayer book. Wow. <laughs> so thank you, Herb Brokering. God bless your memory among us. Uh, and uh, if you want to take a look at this very creative book, uh, it's be up on the front. Here. It might be actually good for next October for the junior high to sing in uh, one of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to where we were. I was, we were talking about the Psalms, um, how much you love the Psalms. And he called it a little Bible. And then, uh, we'll skip that one. But the top one, Romans gave Luther his theology, but it was the Psalms that gave him his thunder. <laughs> But he especially loved Paul's letters. Um, his, he loved Romans, but he did preach on it very often. We talked about that. 
<laughs> and then he called James the epistle of straw, and uh, just because of his emphasis on faith alone. Uh, and then the next slide, we I did battle with Martin Luther on this slide because he didn't like Revelation, and I love Revelation. Uh, and I think it points to Jesus and the hope for God's people, and it, I don't think Luther understood it. Um, uh, so then, the books that he didn't like as much, he put in the back, and so <laughs> still in the, in the German Bible today, there are these books in the back of the German including uh, Hebrews, James, Jude, Revelation. I'm surprised Hebrews is on the list because yeah. he, he lectured quite a bit on Hebrews. Uh, I don't know why. And I w we looked at um, what are in Luther's works. The first 30 volumes of the 55 are on the Bible. And then um, <coughs> upcoming volumes that are still to be printed. And that's where we left off when the choir came in. And uh, now we're going to go to Luther the Preacher. Luther the Preacher. And a lot of this is based on um, Fred Moiser's book, Luther the Preacher. And you know what? Uh, to be honest, I'll be honest with you that to say, my 30, this September will be 35 years as a pastor, as a preacher. And sometimes in those 35 years, I don't feel like preaching, okay? That's mm -hmm. honestly. But when, it, and when those, in those lowest moments, I get this book out, and I'm completely re-inspired again mm -hmm. to be preaching God's Word. This is just a fantastic little book for pastors, uh, for future pastors, uh, to read Luther the Preacher. So we're going to, I'll give you some of the quotes from the book here. <clears throat> this is a slide that I used in January, but I want to repeat this one slide again, and that's with all three of these quotes, the point is that God's written word points us to God's living word, that the scriptures are about Jesus. They keep pointing us to Jesus, right? A favorite quote is, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. That's, that's a, like a one sentence summary of Luther's preaching. Um, I like this quote, next quote, this book, this quote comes from, uh, this book, Martin Luther and the Enduring Word of God, um, and Robert Kolb said this, that a preacher is like a carpenter, his or her tool is God's Word, because his hearers with whom he has to act and work are so different and diverse, he should not always sing the same song and deliver just one message. But because the hearers are diverse, he should threaten, terrify, criticize, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Wow. Wow. Okay. okay. <laughs> Luther advised his students to develop your own style. If you cannot preach an hour, then preach a half hour. Order an hour. Do not try to imitate others. Center on the shortest, simplest point, the heart of the matter, and leave the rest to God. Um, the next one is hilarious. Watch this next one. About his own preaching, Luther observed, I have often wanted to spit on myself in the pulpit. Fewy on you! What did you preach? He regretted not following the outline. But just this sermon, the people praised the most that I had not preached so wonderful a sermon in a long time. And that's sometimes how that works for preachers. You think it's like the worst sermon ever, and then people, some people... Now the next two slides are some details from, from this book. So we'll spend a little bit of time on the next two slides talking about some fascinating facts about Luther's preaching here. You know, we talk about the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion, right? Mm -hmm. Christ is really present in Holy Communion. Luther also believed Christ is truly present in the preaching of God's Word. The real presence of Christ. And then nothing except Christ should be preached. He didn't write out his sermons. His sermons were written down by note-takers. Mm -hmm. And some, one, uh, one, person, one of his note-takers, he said... He, that sermon was better than what I preached. <laughs> uh, and 
<laughs> Ed Warburg and, and later he wrote what's called po what they call postals. And postals were not sermons themselves, but kind of explanations or commentaries. And the, the preachers back then actually used these postals to help them in their preaching. He wrote them for a one-year lectionary. Um, they varied in length from 11 pages to 127 pages oh, wow. on the story of the wise men. <laughs> That's a good question. Reading the apostles, you can read them in Luther's works. The what they're buying my books. Yes, know? yes. So I'm not. That's, but I, that's a good question. I don't know exactly where, uh, but are they interesting and exciting? Or? <laughs> they were, he, his, he's a very colorful writer, yeah. right? So we know that. Uh, let's look at some more about his typical week of preaching. Services on Sunday at 5 a.m. Although one one commentary said. Jeff, sorry. <laughs> but it's good news, Jeff. At winter, it's at 6 a.m. Oh. <laughs> With a sermon on the epistle. I, the epistle, you all know what epistle is? Epistle is the New Testament, one of Paul's letters or Peter's letters. Um, I get at 10 with a sermon on the gospel. Afternoon on one of the lessons, Old Testament or catechism. Monday, Tuesday, sermons on the catechism. Wednesday, Matthew's gospel. Thursday, Friday, Apostolic Letters, Saturday afternoon, John's Gospel. And the reason why he was preaching so often, it was also because he was part of the university. You know, so it wasn't just the congregation there, but it was also with the students. Most years, many years, he preached over a hundred times. Um, from the start of his preaching, he gave much greater emphasis to Scripture than any of his contemporaries. Luther insists on finding the heart of the text. Not only was his conscience captive to the written word of God, so was his preaching. Um, Luther thought of his office of preacher and pastor not of one of power, but one of service, through which a congregation meets God and has God's word brought to them. The first duty of the gospel preacher is to declare God's law and to show the nature of sin. Um, he said that the one who masters the art, the exact distinction between law and gospel, should be called the doctor of theology. <coughs> you want to quote this to Pastor Tim today? I would not have preachers torment their hearers and detain them with long, tedious <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Tim told me to time his sermon. It was, it was only 16 minutes long. It was a very good sermon. I loved his opening Compare contrast with the transfiguration yeah. and the, um, yeah. and the oh, cross. Oh, that's not, yeah. That was yeah, very that was good. good. Mm -hmm. Was Martin Luther just about an hour, typically, his, uh, his sermons? sermons? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. In, in 1520, I'll, I will take them at the end. In 1520, George Kunzel asked Luther's advice on the beginning and end of sermons. Luther said that he omitted verbose prologues. <laughs> And at the end say, that's enough, or more another time, or enough said. <laughs> but here's a, this is another fun, fun one. It's commonly said that these are three qualifications to mark a good preacher. Preachers step up, then speak up,